In this module, we'll try and cover certain important concepts about the important topic of glaucoma. As you all know, glaucoma is a disorder in which there is an affection of the optic nerve. Contrary to the misconception harbored in most of the cases, it is a disease related to the intraocular pressure and the intraocular pressure being high causes a problem with the optic nerve. Now this is no longer the fact. The fact is that it is just an optic neuropathy which can be multifactorial. But all in all, the only modifiable factor in the treatment is uh, intraocular pressure that can be modulated downwards to treat the disease. Now if we start with the clinical anatomy and the physiology to understand the basics better. The intraocular pressure is maintained by the fine balance of aqueous secretion from the pars plicata uh, of the ciliary body, the transpupillary flow of aqueous into the anterior chamber and the final drainage from the conventional pathway through the anterior chamber angle. Besides this, there is an unconventional outflow channel which can assume a great significance when it is modified for the treatment purpose that is the uvo scleral outflow. So the one is the conventional and the second is the uvo scleral outflow. The conventional outflow forms the majority of the drainage of the aqueous from the eye. The conventional outflow, any imbalance in the above that is either an increased production of the aqueous or an obstruction to the drainage of the aqueous can lead to an imbalance and increase in the intraocular pressure leading to ocular hypertension or high intraocular pressure. Whether that translates into glaucoma will be decided by the susceptibility of the individual optic nerve, the previous conditions of the eye and the levels to which the pressure rises. Outflow of all the parts of the conventional outflow system, the juxtacanalicular connective tissue or the JCT offers the maximum resistance to the outflow of aqueous humor. Coming to the important part about the blood supply of the optic nerve, it is predominantly from the choroidal blood vessels or the annulus of Zinhaler, from the short posterior ciliary vessels and any perfusion problem related to the systemic circulation can affect the perfusion pressure in these vessels and can ultimately lead to an optic neuropathy which can be a part of the pathogenesis of any glaucoma. This ischemic optic neuropathy can present as an ischemic optic neuropathy per se or a chronic optic neuropathy in terms of glaucoma. The ocular perfusion pressure that is the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the intraocular pressure is a very important factor in modern day glaucoma therapy which can explain progression of glaucoma despite control of intraocular pressure or incidence of normal tension glaucomas. So as we all know today glaucoma is a chronic progressive optic neuropathy. It can be caused by an raised intraocular pressure, perfusion problems of the nerve alone, combination of the two. However, as we already said, the intraocular pressure is the only modifiable factor that can help us in the treatment of glaucoma. It is classified depending on the age of onset into congenital, juvenile and adult types. Depending on the outflow pathways and associated ocular pathology, it can be classified into open angle and angle closure. Essentially, we classify by having a look at the anterior chamber angle that is the space or the angle formed in between the iris, periphery and the cornea. That cannot be normally visualized by the naked eye due to total internal reflection taking place at the posterior surface of the cornea. So a superimposition of a gonio lens or a lens medium on top of the cornea can refract the rays out of the eye permitting the visualization of the anterior chamber angle. No diagnosis of glaucoma is complete without doing a gonioscopy or visualization of the anterior chamber angle which is fundamental to the classification of the disease. So further the open and the angle closure types can be divided into primary as well as secondary types. Congenital and juvenile types are depending upon their age of onset. And they are distinct entities in itself and they require separate consideration. Most of the glaucomas we know are asymptomatic in nature and they are detected by chance at a routine ophthalmic examination. Contrary to the common belief, uh, they complain of pain, redness and vomiting which forms a very very small subset of glaucoma patients. Some symptoms that point to the presence of high pressure or glaucoma in patients who have them are frontal headache, brow ache, 
frequent change of glasses, colored halos around the light, especially in conditions of mesopic illumination. And the patients may or may not notice a small amount of delay in the dark adaptation. The symptoms are commensurate with the time of rise of intraocular pressure. The gradual rise in the IOP or the gradual rise in the intraocular pressure is asymptomatic, whereas an acute elevation leads to stretching of the ocular nerves and these can present with acute onset redness, sudden onset diminution of vision, vomiting and nausea. Presence of high intraocular pressure alone does not indicate glaucoma. The basic denominator is an optic neuropathy. This is one fact that everybody should remember. A structurally abnormal looking disc and an abnormal visual field to go along with it. But at least a structurally abnormal or a suspicious disc is the most important for the diagnosis of glaucoma and not intraocular pressure. Now we come to the three permutations which we can consider to understand the concept easily. First is high intraocular pressure with normal disc and normal field. Just like a high measurement of blood pressure, it is called as an ocular hypertension. Ocular hypertension is defined in the relation to the normal range of intraocular pressure, which is the mean intraocular pressure of the population plus two standard deviations or minus two standard deviations on either side. That translates to a range of 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. In case the pressure is above two standard deviations, it is called as ocular hypertension. This did not translate into glaucoma. So, increase in intraocular pressure need not be equivalent to glaucoma. This increase in intraocular pressure is with reference to plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean of the population. So, this topic is to be understood that a particular level of pressure need not indicate glaucoma, but that causing an optic neuropathy becomes glaucoma. This is the important concept that we should know. Normal levels of intraocular pressure in some cases along with a suspicious disc with a normal visual field is labeled as a disc suspect. Normal intraocular pressure, open angle and gonioscopy which is the test which we described of for seeing the angle with an abnormal disc in a field that correlates to the optic disc can be seen in normal tension glaucoma. That is if we have an IOP or intraocular pressure that training that is normal at all times in the day with associated optic nerve problems that is the disc changes along with visual field changes. Disc is the structural defect whereas the visual field changes are the functional defect. If both are present along with an open angle and normal intraocular pressure it classifies as a normal tension glaucoma. This is very very important for us to understand before under moving on to the further topics. More than 40% of structural damage needs to take place before a detectable visual field change occurs on white on white perimetry. So there are certain gamut of tests that are available now like the optical coherence tomography, the GDX nerve fiber analyzer that can detect some structural changes before the functional changes develop on perimetry although their value in medical practice still is under validation. Some mandatory tests that need to be done before labeling any patient as having glaucoma and initiating treatment are the following. First is a visual acuity, a second is intraocular pressure. Very important, the measurement of pressure should be done by applination by a Goldman's applination tonometer which is the gold standard as on today. Third is the central cornea thickness which can give us an independent risk factor for development of glaucoma according to modern studies. Fundamental to all glaucomas in capital letters is a gonioscopy which is mandatory for the classification of the glaucomas. Fundus examination needless to see the optic nerve and a visual field test which will indicate the functional damage of the optic nerve. So these are done in the following way. If you can see the slide on your left, this is the examination of the angle by a gonio lens. This is the peripheral part of the cornea, this is the root of the iris, they merge to form the anterior chamber angle and this particular structure is graded depending upon the visibility of the trabecular meshwork into open angle and angle closure. Fundus biomicroscopy looks something like this on the right side. Here we have a 90 diopter lens which is used in this particular case with a slit beam on the slit lamp and what you see in the center is the optic nerve head. The pale area in between is called as the cup 
whereas the entire area which is seen is called as a disc. This is the place from where the blood vessels come into the eye and the ratio of the vertical cup and disc is pathognomonic or rather an important parameter which should note in the treatment of glaucoma. Red free and color fundus photography can be done for additional documentation since this forms a permanent form of documentation rather than the slit lamp biomicroscopy but it does not substitute it as this is a two dimensional evidence as compared to the three dimensions we get and the stereopsis we get while seeing the biomicroscopy. Automated visual field testing or automated perimetry is the functional gold standard for treatment of glaucoma patients. As of today, the 24-2 CETA standard program on the Humphreys is the most frequently used program for automated field testing. We classify the glaucoma if present on the evidence of optic neuropathy and field effects or at least an optic neuropathy as primary open angle, secondary open angle, the examples of which are pigmentary and pseudo exfoliation glaucomas. Worth mentioning is that both of these are relatively difficult to treat and have a relentless progression. Primary angle closure and secondary angle closure glaucomas, the examples of which are neovascular and uveitic glaucoma with synechia. Treatment of glaucoma in general depends on the patient and the disease profile. The extent of the existing damage and the life expectancy are the two major things along with the comorbidities associated if any to consider the modality of treatment. The aim of the treatment is that the vision should outlive the patient. As we all know, glaucoma produces abnormalities in the visual field and the central vision is affected late in the disease. Broadly, the treatment of this disease is classified into pharmacotherapy, lasers and incisional surgery. Pharmacotherapy is the most practiced treatment because of the uncertainty of the surgical outcome of glaucoma as on today and the wide variety of effective medications that are available in our purse. Pharmacotherapy is the first line in adult glaucomas. The management of acute angle closure is however slightly different that we will discuss in the subsequent slide. There is something called as a concept of maximum medical therapy in which the, all the medications are exhausted before an option of surgery is offered to the patient due to inadequate control or intolerable side effects of the medications which are started in the pharmacotherapy. Pharmacotherapy of glaucoma involves predominantly five classes of uh, drugs which are freely available as on today. The first line drug are the prostaglandin analogs which are the first line treatment for a chronic simple or open angle glaucoma. These drugs produce a 30% approximate drop of intraocular pressure from the baseline. The contraindications of these are in case of inflammation as they are prostaglandin analogs, they are pro-inflammatory or in the ruptured capsule where the inflammatory mediators may produce a macular edema and decrease the vision. Ruptured capsule may be pre-operative, pre-therapy due to a yak capsulotomy done after cataract surgery or maybe a, a posterior capsular rupture that has occurred during a, a eventful phacoemulsification or cataract surgery. Side effects of these drugs are notably skin pigmentation, lash growth and macular edema and worsening of the existing uveitis. So they are contraindicated in history of herpes simplex or uveitic uh, patients, it is a relative contraindication. The second class of drugs is beta blockers, predominant one being timolol which is a non-selective beta blocker. Selective beta blockers like bitoxol are available but the efficacy is said to be slightly less. Monotherapy in current day management with beta blockers is avoided because of doubtful nighttime efficacy of the drug and nighttime peaks in intraocular pressure in many of the glaucomas. This will be avoided in depression, dyslipidemias, cardiac problems and patient already on oral beta blockers because it doesn't have any additional effect. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors is the third class consisting of dorazolamide and brinzolamide. These are relatively safe drugs for all the age groups but not used in allergies to patients with sulfa medications because they have a sulfa group to their chemical constitution. Alpha agonists, example of which is brimolid in tartrate are to be avoided in extremes of age. These drugs are predisposed to causing neuropsychiatric complications in young as well as old age patients. Patients on monoamine oxidase inhibitors and neuropsychiatric medications are to be treated with caution or this drug is to be entirely avoided in them. This a local side effect of follicular conjunctivitis is known in this particular drug and can lead to the discontinuation of therapy if there is a fulminant red eye associated. Cholinergic medicines although have fallen into disrepute because of the other more effective medicines involved. They are good drugs for treatment of certain glaucomas like aphakic glaucoma. However, relative contraindications in young individuals who are phakic which can lead to, because these can lead to ciliary spasm and chronic frontal headaches. Complications like retinal detachment due to its nature of action and contraction of the peripheral retina 
or the peripheral uvea which has its attachments at the oral base of the retina and iris cyst formation on chronic use are known in pilocarpine contraindications in uveitis and relative contraindication in myopes all present antiglaucoma medications however are known to cause severe ocular surface problems and inflammation of the ocular surface due to the presence of a preservative called benzalkonium chloride combination drugs are also available and these are in terms of fixed dose combinations most of them involve timolol as the second drug coming to one specific entity that needs a special and a separate mention angle closure glaucoma the angle closure glaucoma consists of five stages that is the latent stage the intermittent stage the acute stage the chronic stage and the absolute stage the thing to be remembered is they do not come in one line so this is a very important fact that these stages may be independent of each other may need not always be sequential and they can jump presentation of chronic angle closure in terms of visual field changes on perimetry can mimic open angle glaucomas due to the gradual rise in the pressure unless they are superimposed by attacks of acute angle closure acute attack of angle closure classically presents with the common perception of glaucoma that is acute onset pain redness vomiting and a sudden rise of intraocular pressure and photophobia signs a ciliary injection corneal edema from limbus to limbus raised intraocular pressure and dilated and fixed mid dilated pupil the treatment of angle closure it is an ophthalmic emergency emergent treatment with pressure lowering medications like intravenous mannitol oral acetazolamide to decrease the intraocular pressure once the intraocular pressure is reduced by these above two maneuvers and the attack is broken then the addition of pilocarpine to constrict the pupil and move the iris away from the root of the ciliary body and opening the angle once in a while if pilocarpine is not effective peripheral laser iridoplasty can be attempted but is done very infrequently in cases the acute attack does not break even after these maneuvers anterior chamber paracentesis can be tried to break the attack addition of topical alpha agonist drug and a beta blocker combination can definitely be used in addition to the other anti glaucoma medications with a small dose of steroid to decrease the inflammation associated with this disease most important part is after the acute stage is over a laser iridotomy can be made in the peripheral iris to give an alternative pathway to the transpupillary pathway so that the classical formation of iris bombe because of relatively pupillary block is mitigated and repeated attack of angle closure is avoided it is imperative in these cases to do a prophylactic laser iridotomy of the normal other eye because they have a high chance of going into angle closure review of the pressure following an acute attack is the main indicator for decision of the final, for the course of therapy in case the pressure is reduced there is no synechial closure of the angle then the patient can be treated by medical means but if the pressure does not come down to desired levels incisional surgery may be the way to go in this particular slide shows yag laser iridotomy being done in the two eyes if you can see a small hole in addition to the pupil so transpupillary aqueous can come out through this hole in both the eyes and this may not be the only route so in case of a relative pupillary block the aqueous can come out from the peripheral hole preventing the forward bowing of the iris and the further angle closure so once you have a pathway from here this phenomenon does not occur and this can act as a prophylaxis for further synechial closure of the angle surgical therapy for glaucoma consists of many advanced techniques the most common technique used nowadays is trabeculectomy however new techniques like deep sclerectomy canaloplasty viscocanalostomy gold chunks express valves and glaucoma drainage devices have been used to treat this disease ab interno treatments under investigation are the cypass the gold shunt and the eye stents which are implanted from inside the anterior chamber and hence called ab interno whereas all the other surgeries are approached from outside hence called ab externo cyclodestructive procedures have a limited role like cyclocryo cyclodiode in cases where there is very poor or no visual prognosis and you have to treat a painful blind eye just to show you the other slides to give you a faint understanding of anti glaucoma surgeries on the left hand side top we have a superficial flap and deep flap that is made the lower deep flap is excised and the anterior chamber tract is formed and all this uh, these things are sutured back in place with the conjunctiva and suture and you get a trans uh, transscleral filtration into the subconjunctiva space from the anterior chamber and this forms what is called as a normal trabeculectomy in case of glaucoma drainage device instead of a scleral window creating the opening 
the open uh, the patency is maintained by putting a tube made of polypropylene or silicone into the anterior chamber and it is drained under the conjunctiva by way of an implant which if you can see here is visible under the conjunctiva as an elevation this has an inbuilt valve which i need uh, opens at a particular level of intraocular pressure maintaining the pressure at that level and hence preventing pressure spikes complications of atrial glaucoma surgery are very very important and in fact are the main cause for pursuing maximum medical therapy in most of the clinics flat anterior chamber choroidal detachment hypotonic maculopathy infectious endophthalmitis late onset bleb leakages are especially true for cases like trabeculectomy tube related problems like tube erosion retractions tube cornea touches like if we go to the previous slide the if this not this is not placed properly not sutured properly this can retract back this can touch the cornea damage the endothelium or this can get blocked by abnormal contents and then it this valve will stop functioning so all these things are specific to tube implants whereas the above complications are common for trabeculectomy just to show you the final outcomes of trabeculectomy and differentiating between a avascular and a ideal bleb the one on your right shows a ideal bleb with good normal retinal vasculature this is a avascular bleb where mitomycin c has been used there is a high chance of infectious endophthalmitis if the bleb leaks from this weak point and exogenous infection can track in from here close observation is mandatory after every anterior glaucoma surgery and hence it is required that the patient is on very regular follow up so all in all as on today the gold standard of therapy remains initial medical followed by surgical therapy lasers do have a limited role the best quoted is the laser iridotomy in angular closure glaucomas so slt or selective laser trabeculoplasty or argon laser trabeculoplasty have not proved their worth in gold and hence pharmacotherapy as on today forms the main line followed by incisional surgery